get ready to be awed and amazed. This famous ocean liner is one beauty of a ship. Hello, I am Alex the Historian, your guide to this virtual tour through time here aboard the RMS Queen Mary. The Queen Mary is a retired ocean liner built in John Brown shipyards in Clydebank, Scotland, starting in the year 1930. Due to the Great Depression, her launch date was delayed until 1934, but she held her maiden voyage in May of 1936. She served as a troop ship in World War II, carrying 810,730 GIs to war, all while enemy submarines hunted her down in an effort to claim a large bounty that Hitler himself had placed on the ship. When the Cunard Line retired the Queen Mary in October of 1967, she had already been purchased by the city of Long Beach, California, and sailed here under her own power, arriving on December 9th of that year. Here we can see the outside of her hull. Her steel hull plates are held together with over 10 million rivets, some of which were hammered by machine, but most had to be done by manpower. She is considered one of the strongest and most well-built ships ever made, at a length of 1,019 and a half feet long, 118 feet wide, and a gross register tonnage of 81,237 tons, she is the largest British-built ocean liner currently in existence, and the very last Atlantic liner built before World War II. Here we can see one of the Queen Mary's 24 riveted steel motorized lifeboats. It is 36 feet long, 12 feet wide, and was built to hold 145 passengers. This is where we enter the ship. This is the original first class entry on A deck. Up ahead on the left is the old purser's desk, which is now used as the front desk for the hotel. And here is the first class midship stairwell. It is paneled in white English ash wood and still features its original silver bronze handrails. We'll begin from the top of the ship and work our way to the bottom. On a side note, you can learn more about the RMS Queen Mary on my website, RMS QM Wiki, a digital encyclopedia of the ship. The link is in the description and comment section below, or scan the QR code on your screen. Not only can you learn about this ship's history and design, but you can explore each area deck by deck. It's a great resource for those of you who love to learn. The ship reopened from a three-year closure in April of 2023 and has seen a surge in popularity that has helped the ship to turn a profit every month since then. Queen Mary has also been undergoing repairs and refurbishments, and work is still ongoing. This is the bridge the highest deck on the ship. It would have only been accessible to the captain and the navigation officers. Extending out from the ship are the bridge wings. These were used to better see over the sides when docking. And now we enter the wheelhouse of the ship. This is where the ship was steered and where officers gave commands to the engine room. Those commands were usually sent with the use of these brass telegraphs. There was a telegraph for each of the four engines and an extra telegraph that relayed emergency steering instructions to the crew in the steering gear room in case there was a problem with the helms. But that was only a last case scenario. The ship had two hydraulic telemotor helms for redundancy, which allowed instantaneous steering. The gray wheel on the right was an automatic helm nicknamed the Iron Mike. It was mainly used to keep the ship on a steady course out at sea. If there were commands too complicated to relay by telegraph, the ship had these special sets of telephones, called loudophones, specially designed to cancel out the loud noises of the boiler and engine rooms. Here is what remains of the stabilizer console, which was installed in 1958. Through the door, we can see the chart room where navigation officers would review or plan a route. Beyond it is the captain's chart room.
we are now looking up at stainless steel replicas of the Queen Mary's three funnels. When the Queen Mary was converted to a hotel in 1969, the original funnels were removed to access the boiler rooms far below. The original funnels broke apart upon removal, so these replicas were installed afterward. However, the first funnel still has two of the Queen Mary's three original steam-powered Typhon whistles. Yes, it's called Typhon, not Typhoon, and they were called whistles, not horns. The third whistle is currently being used on the Queen Mary too, but one of these seven-foot-long whistles still sounds a few times every day. We'll listen to it towards the end of the video. On the sports deck below, we have reached the forward end, which has a wraparound promenade for the ship's navigation officers. We can look over the bow of the ship and see the foremast, which has the crow's nest for the lookouts. Ships today don't use crow's nests because radar does the job even better. Sports deck is also the location of the officers' quarters. This apartment is the captain's quarters, last occupied by Captain John Jones. You can see that he even has a space for entertaining guests. The little room next to the captain's belonged to the first officer, and next to that was the staff captain's quarters. Staff captains were more like the hotel general manager, allowing the captain himself to tend to his general duties. Nearby is a lavatory, which the officers would have shared. The captain, however, had his own private lavvy. The four faucets you see on the shower offered not only hot and cold fresh water, but also hot and cold, clean salt water. As we head further aft on sports deck, you can see a large open space where first-class passengers would have played deck games such as shuffleboard or deck tennis. This abandoned passage you see here was the way that passengers could get to the dog kennels. Dogs on the ship were fed and cared for by the ship's butcher and were walked daily by the bellhops. On the other side of sports deck is a passage that leads further aft to more deck game areas. Though you can stop and see the ham radio station, this isn't the original radio room aboard the ship. That was located on the deck below. But if we peek through the window next to it, we can see the dome of what used to be the first class squash court. The entire room was soundproofed and decorated with beautiful sycamore and maple veneers. Now we climb down to the next level, which is called Sun Deck. This is where the outdoor promenade allowed passengers to take the air and enjoy the sunshine when it was out. You can see the lifeboats are no longer on their davits. Currently, two lifeboats remain on the ship, with another on the dock, and eight more awaiting restoration in a storage area. Eventually, the remaining lifeboats will be restored, placed atop their respective davits, and the rest of the davits will have lightweight replicas on them. The davits were designed to lower a fully laden lifeboat at a speed of 60 feet per second. At 80 feet above the water, it's a long way down from this level. On the far aft end of sun deck sits the veranda grill. It was considered an exclusive dining venue during the day and a fantastic nightclub in the evening.
The entire room was designed and decorated by the famed artist Doris Zenkaisen. She had to repaint the artwork after World War II because this room was used as a sort of military office and papers were tacked directly onto the canvas paintings. If we go down a level, here on the aft end of the ship, we find ourselves on promenade deck. These windows on the right led into the former second-class smoking room, which for many decades now has been used as a wedding chapel. But sometime soon, this space will be reimagined as an artifact exhibit. Nearby is the entry into the second-class stairwell, which is entirely paneled with quilted maple on top and a Nigerian mahogany dado on the bottom. We'll show you what's on the next level below, later on in the tour. For now, let's continue forward on promenade deck to show you the first class smoking room. It stretches the height of two decks, and all around, you can see the rich tiger oak panels that adorn the walls. Decorating the room are two separate paintings done by Edward Wadsworth. Beneath the forward painting is the only real fireplace on the entire ship, and flanking either side of it are carved limewood panels by James Woodford. Originally, this room was for men only, but in 1947, women were allowed access. You'll notice along the pillars and walls at the same waist-high level are white buttons made of roanoid, a form of bakelite. These made it easier for passengers to request a steward. The next room forward on the port side of the ship is a coffee shop, but originally it was a much larger room called the Long Gallery. It connected all the first-class promenade deck spaces and was paneled in betula and maple burr. And beneath the paintings were beautiful marble tables with silver bronze stanchions. Going forward again, we see the first-class main lounge. This was a place where passengers could have afternoon tea or relax during the day. And at night, there was live music from the ship's band and even movies were projected on the screen on stage. This room is the tallest room on the ship, spanning a little more than three decks high. There are eight decorative urn lamps and three electric fireplace mantles. The lamps and mantles were all carved from the same block of golden onyx crystal. The relief artwork over the forward fireplace was done in cream-colored gesso that was accented with gold gilding. It was created by Alfred Oakley and Gilbert Bays. It shows the Greek mythology that when two unicorns spar, the clashing of their horns produces beautiful music. Just forward of the main lounge is the former first-class radio telephone room, where passengers could place phone calls and write out radiograms to people on the mainland. On the starboard side is the former writing room. The upper windows still display motifs of literature. Moving ahead, we see a telephone booth and window displays. We are now in the main hall. The main hall was the social area of the ship and also where passengers could do their shopping. The Queen Mary herself is nicknamed the Ship of Beautiful Woods. That's because the ship's bulkheads and fittings are covered in 56 different types of rare and exotic woods. 
This decorative panel shows only 37 of those different woods, and it just so happens to be covering up the unused starboard elevators. Originally, the main hall had corkoid floors, done in an emerald green and broken cream pattern. The bulkheads were paneled in bands of oak nut and chestnut wood. After World War II, Cunard wanted to brighten up the color of the room, replacing the corkoid with a cream color linoleum, and the wall paneling was replaced with pigskin hide panels, done in seafoam green and broken cream. Recently, the floors have been redone, but they are still linoleum, and the patterns were hand laid to closely match the 1947 design. The corner shop on the left currently sells sweets, and beyond it is the former first class library, which today sells merchandise on the very shelves that once held over 1,700 books. If we go to the starboard side of Main Hall, we can see the former first class drawing room, which used to be a feminine room designed for the ladies. But on Sundays and religious holidays, it converted to a Christian chapel for services. During World War II, the drawing room was used as Winston Churchill's press room. Continuing forward on the starboard side, we pass the center shop and head towards the first class children's playroom. Today it looks much different than it did in 1936. The first children to slide down the chute were Princess Elizabeth, later known as Queen Elizabeth II, and her sister, Princess Margaret. The room's most striking feature was the light fixture that was simultaneously a sun and a crescent moon, and around it were glittering stars. Moving on, just steps away is the Observation Lounge, a fantastic room, almost a full semicircle. The Burma Bright balustrades depict motifs of Greek mythology separated by beer casks. Even the bar itself, which is paneled in Macassar ebony and wrapped in bands of silver bronze, is designed to look like a giant beer cask. Right above the bar is a painting, The Royal Jubilee Week by Alfred Thompson. The whole room itself is paneled with the wood of a single and very unique tree, which the carpenters nicknamed Cedar Maw. Now, changing direction, we head aft on the port side, passing the first class music room on the right and walking towards the former first class lecture room, which shows a video about the ship's World War II veterans. If we head back into the main hall towards the first class main staircase, we can see the marble medallion of the ship's namesake. This is Her Majesty Queen Mary, consort to King George V. Cunard wanted to name the ship after her and invited her to christen the ship on the day of its launch. Heading down the stairs, we reach main deck, and immediately we see the first class travel bureau. This is a place where the passengers could book other Cunard voyages or secure tickets to travel to and from their destinations in the future. It is paneled in my favorite wood veneer, quilted maple. If we go all the way forward to the bow of the ship, we reach the forecastle deck, where all the warping and anchor gear is. It was never accessible to passengers, but the area just aft of it was the third-class promenade, and it wrapped around the base of the foremast. The large orange pipes you see are actually seven boom cranes for lifting cargo and vehicles down into the two cargo hatches. If we were to continue aft on this same level, we would be inside the former third-class garden lounge. Today the room is used for meetings and private events, but in the old days, it was decorated with wicker furniture and palm trees.
the original marquetry panel is still on display. Going further aft on main deck, we have to traverse the entire length of the first class corridor. This corridor in particular has light English sycamore above and dark Australian walnut below. Those handrails were added soon after the maiden voyage in 1936 and are made of roanoid, a form of bakelite, which itself is an early form of plastic. This hallway also shows the beautiful upwards curve in the ship's design, called shear. Shear and camber were designed to give the decks added strength for times when the ship was cresting huge swells at sea. But the curvature wasn't a perfect semicircle, which means that any doors facing inward to the corridor have a unique slant. All the way aft on main deck, we reach the second class areas. Entering through what used to be the second class children's nursery, we go around the staircase to the port side. and we can see an area that is walled off. This used to be the second class writing room. And going a bit forward, we can see a closed door, which used to be the second class library. The library could also be converted to a chapel. But if we go back towards the staircase, we can take a moment to appreciate a bit of history. Through the black double doors behind a support pillar used to be a small Austin Reed store stuffed into a space no larger than a walk-in closet. But the real treat of main deck is the room beyond this one, accessible by two sets of double doors. This is the second class main lounge. It used to be surrounded by an enclosed promenade which today has been incorporated into the overall floor space of the lounge. But it still looks much as it did in the 1930s. If we were to walk down that enclosed promenade, it would take us out to the stern area where there is an open space for the passengers to relax and enjoy the air. If we continue aft and take the steps further down, we arrive at the very stern of the ship, called the poop deck. There was more warping and mooring gear in this area, but Disney removed it all in the early 1990s. Nearby, through the steel hatch doors, is one of the more interesting places on the ship. We descend down to B deck, into the isolation ward. This is an area where stowaways or passengers suffering contagious ailments or parasites would be kept. It was essentially a hospital. Here you can see the starboard side held female passengers. And right next to it was a cabin for two female nurses. And on the port side of this area was an identical set of rooms where male passengers were looked after by male attendants. But let's go back up to A deck. Here at the aft end of the A deck corridor, at the top of the aft second class staircase, is the capstan lounge. But in 1936, it was known as the Second Class Overflow Lounge. It featured a magnificent nickel-plated art piece of a woman, created by artist Rebel Stanton. Cunard eventually turned this room into a teenager's lounge called the Beachcombers Club, and then after the ship came to Long Beach, it was converted to a meeting room. If we go all the way to the forward end of A Deck, past all the second and first class staterooms, we reach the third class staircase and lift area, and beyond it are some exhibit areas that were put into the former third class smoking room. Here we see some artifacts of the ship's watertight door and other fire suppression systems. On a side note, 
All the original fire doors in the first class corridors are still functional and in use. Should there ever be a fire on board, a newly rebuilt sprinkler system should help to suppress the fire while fire doors close off the affected areas to prevent the spread. Not only that, but all the ship's wood paneling is made of a material called turnall plywood. It's essentially plywood boards with a layer of asbestos sandwiched in between to prevent the wood from being totally consumed by the flames. The exotic wood veneers were glued to the top layer of the plywood, and that's what we see today. This is the Kinard Story exhibit, hosted by the Kinard Line. And again, it was once all part of the third class smoking room. If we head outside, we find ourselves on the well deck. The well deck is a recessed deck on the bow of the ship, designed to break up massive ocean waves that ride over the bow. It deflects the waves to prevent them from damaging the superstructure, although its effectiveness was questionable. Nevertheless, the RMS Queen Mary was the only Cunard liner to ever have a well deck. Now let's go down to the third class staircase on B deck. There were two third class lounges here which today are used as meeting rooms that can be booked by visitors. But the one on the port side also functioned as a cinema for third-class passengers. The one on the starboard side functioned as a lounge and library. Beyond this doorway was the third-class children's nursery, and on the port side was the former synagogue. You heard right, the RMS Queen Mary had a synagogue. Many of her passengers in the 1930s were refugees, including Jewish refugees, fleeing Europe due to the increasing power of Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party. This synagogue was available to all three classes and was designed by famed architect Cecil Jacob Epperl and dedicated by Britain's chief rabbi, J.H. Hertz. Its most beautiful feature was its Torah Ark, which was made of oak and Macassar ebony. It held the scrolls behind a gold-plated grille. While the third class entered through this door, there was a side door for the first and second classes. This synagogue was a feature intentionally put on the ship to challenge Nazism. The room today is a storage closet, but the wood paneling and artifacts still exist, so it can be restored in the future. Towards the midship area of B deck, by the first class main staircase, are these two doorways. One was the first class barber shop, and the other was the first class beauty salon. Today, these rooms are used as offices. Heading further aft on B deck, we can see that the corridor makes 90 degree turns as we go around the dome of the first class main restaurant below us. But as we reach the aft end of the dome, we can see this vestibule, which used to have a staircase that led down into the main restaurant, but we'll get back to that later. Right outside the vestibule is a cool little spot I wanted to show you. This is a photo of a cabin steward reading a magazine while he listens for a bell to ring, indicating a passenger is calling for assistance. But he sat right here. If we continue down the corridor on the starboard side, walking further aft, we can see that the old shabby carpets are being replaced with new red carpets. Originally, these corridors had corkoid floors, but carpets help to dampen sound, which unfortunately plagues the hotel rooms. Though the rooms were constructed with soundproofing material, that was almost 90 years ago, when soundproofing material was not as effective as modern materials and techniques. As we continue on, we can see that the wood paneling abruptly ends, this is because we have entered the second class areas. First class had fully paneled hallways, but second and third classes would have corridors with only partial paneling or no paneling at all. And now we arrive at the B deck second class foyer. The floors look a bit rough 
and that's because these are original 1936 corkoid floors done in emerald green and ivory checkerboard patterns. That cabin on the port side used to be the second-class doctor's office. Since we're still on B-Deck, let's go back towards the forward end of the port side. I know some of you who intend to visit the ship will want to see room B-340. For those that don't know, B-340 is marketed as the ship's most haunted room, but if you ask me, it's a bunch of baloney. There is a window that allows you to look in and see some of the room, which is part of their haunted tour, and actually, it's a nice room. Going down the main staircase, we reach our deck, which is the restaurant deck. But this is also where you can see the first class swimming pool. The pool room stands two decks high. It's completely tiled with straw colored terracotta tiles an inch thick. The ceiling has a scattered mosaic of faux mother of pearl and reflects the ambient light. This pool room is not available for swimming. It's merely a display piece. There's currently no guest swimming pool at the Queen Mary Hotel. That's just something to keep in mind if you plan to book a room. But that being said, there are beautiful beaches on the other side of the harbor. When you're on our deck, I do recommend taking a moment to appreciate the elevators. The balustrades and metal doors are all done in silver bronze, and the walls of the foyer are paneled in horizontal bands of English birch, Mazer birch, and Canadian birch. The dotto at the bottom and along the balustrades of the lift areas is English Elm Burr. First Class had seven lifts around the ship, but these two port side elevators are the only ones still in operation and they will take you from our deck to promenade deck. I do recommend taking a ride aboard them. They were originally constructed by the Otis Company and though these 88 year old elevators are a bit rickety, they are very safe. Otis recently inspected and maintained them. The interiors have seen quite a lot of abuse over the years, but underneath it all, the English elm burr wall panels and silver bronze bands offer a faint echo of the original beauty of this space. Continuing our tour of our deck, there are telephone booths by the stairs. If you open the doors, you can see the beautifully paneled interiors. If we leave the foyer and turn around, we can go through this original entry into the first class main restaurant. It is by far the largest room on the ship and was also, by volume, the largest room ever put on an ocean liner in the 1930s. It is 143 feet long and 118 feet wide and towers three decks high. It is so large that the volume of Cunard's first steamship the 207-foot-long Britannia, along with Christopher Columbus's fleet of ships, the Nina, Pinta, and Santa Maria, could fit inside, with enough room to spare to comfortably accommodate all 800 first-class Queen Mary passengers. The room is designed with autumn colors, which is achieved through three shades of the Brazilian Paroba wood paneling, accented with silver bronze reeds. There are 14 flat wood carvings done by Bainbridge Copnell. The painting at the aft end of the room is of the English countryside done by Philip Conard. And below it, bronze grill doors by artists Walter Gilbert and his son Donald. It is behind these doors that a little staircase would have led up to the B-deck vestibule. Walter and Donald also did the silver glass panels around the entrance areas as well as the illuminated medallions with motifs. But the most striking feature of the room is the giant map of the North Atlantic by MacDonald Gill. You can see both the winter and summer routes that the ships took to get across, and there are crystal models of RMS Queen Mary and her companion RMS Queen Elizabeth, which used to move across the map to show passengers their current position on the voyage. Yes, the Queen Mary is a ship of stately beauty. The designers weren't looking to create a ship that had palatial beauty. Instead, they wanted to create an art deco ship that felt more like a modern English manor, sitting somewhere on the countryside. The ship was built to exude comfort and relaxation. Instead of being covered in jewels, gold, and marble, the Queen Mary has a subtle luxury, 
using its rare and exotic wood paneling to showcase the beauty of natural materials. But now, let's go somewhere that feels completely the opposite of that. This footage was filmed in January of 2020, back when they still did tours of the boiler rooms on the ship. This room was once a water softening plant, which took seawater and filtered it for use in the stateroom bathtubs and showers. It could also desalinate the water to make drinking water on demand. This room we are passing through was Boiler Room 1, which held three double-ended scotch boilers that produced steam for the hotel services as well as generated steam for the forward turbo generator room. All the boilers on the ship ran off of number six Bunker C fuel oil, which was kept in massive tanks located within the walls of the double hull. While the scotch boilers were directly fed with forced air, the other boiler rooms themselves were pressurized, like an airplane cabin, in order to force air into the furnaces. This is boiler room two, just like the other three main boiler rooms, this one had six of the ship's 24 Yarrow boilers. The Yarrow boilers produced steam at 400 pounds per square inch, which powered the main engines and after turbo generator room. The white painted areas represent everything below the waterline of the ship. We are now in the forward turbo generator room, looking up where the power controls would have sat. Directly above us is the cofferdam of the first-class swimming pool. These boiler and generator rooms at the time of the publishing of this video are not open for tours, but when they do reopen, they will be available as part of the Steam and Steel tour. It is now time for us to make our way to the engine and gear rooms, which are all located at the lower stern of the ship. When we enter, we find ourselves in the massive lobby of the official museum and exhibit hall of the Queen Mary. It starts off on D-deck, and you have to descend into the lower bowels of the ship from here. Over in the corner sits one of Queen Mary's massive 16-ton spare anchors, brought onto the ship before leaving Southampton for the last time. We descend below into the engine room. The Queen Mary had four propellers, and each one had its own engine, and the four engines were split into two rooms, the forward and aft engine rooms. During the Queen Mary's conversion into a hotel, the forward engine room was removed to make way for a museum space because designers couldn't imagine why tourists would ever want to visit the engine rooms to begin with. As it turned out, the museum they built would flop, and the remaining engine room would be among the most popular exhibits on the ship. This engine room might not look it, but it originally stood the height of five decks and houses two of the original four turbine engines, of which we will get a closer look at in a moment. Steam was supplied to the ship's engines from the 24 Yarrow boilers, that steam was piped into this room and directed to the two engines. A single engine had four turbines that operated on various steam pressures. The first was a high pressure turbine, which exhausted into an intermediate pressure turbine, which exhausted into a second intermediate pressure turbine, which then exhausted into a low pressure turbine. The high pressure and second intermediate pressure turbines were both capable of spinning in reverse, which gave the Queen Mary half power in that direction. The steam was then cooled and condensed back into water, which was pumped back to the boilers to restart the steam cycle. Here is the control panel for this engine room. The gauges read the various steam pressures coming in and out of the various machines, as well as oil pressure gauges, and a gauge for measuring the speed of the propeller shaft.
these giant steam turbines operate similar to a pinwheel. There are several rows of blades on the inside, and when steam is blown into the turbine, it causes the blades to spin at an incredibly high speed. That speed is then converted into power using these massive gear boxes containing a central gear that is 14 feet in diameter and that turns the propeller shaft with an immense amount of rotational force. All four of Queen Mary's engines could produce a combined 200,000 shaft horsepower which helped the ship capture the coveted blue riband for fastest North Atlantic crossing. And she held on to that title for 14 years, only surpassed by one ship, the SS United States, back in 1952. We are now in what's called the Starboard Shaft Alley, it is a long room that houses the two starboard propeller shafts. The shafts are a bit rusted today, but to be fair, keeping the shafts polished would be a tedious daily task. It was easier when the ship was in service. Crewmen would position burlap mats that hung over the shafts and brush them throughout the day as they spun, creating a polished shine. If we were to go up the escalator in the back, it would take us to the steering gear room at the very stern of the ship. But because the escalator is closed, we have to use the side door next to the entrance to the museum lobby. This room houses the massive equipment needed to turn the rudder. The Queen Mary's 160-ton rudder is equal to the tonnage of the Mayflower and was the largest constructed for any ship at the time. This is the hydraulic pumping system that generates the pressure needed to move the four hydraulic rams that turn the rudder. The rudder stock is a rod that runs up to this room. These four hydraulic cylinders are connected to a turning assembly that allows it to push or pull the rudder in either direction. Generally, only two of the cylinders were needed at any given time, but if rough seas or a system failure were to happen, they had the extra two cylinders to help out. Steering assemblies like these often exerted so much force onto the ship that this whole aft section would require more robust decks and support frames. Here we enter the propeller room, which displays one of the four propellers that pushed the ship through the Atlantic swells. We're in a steel box that was attached to the outside of the hull during the ship's conversion to a museum and it surrounds the outer port side propeller, which is still attached to its original shaft and sits in a pool of fresh water, which keeps it safe from the corrosion it will face in seawater. The propeller is made of manganese bronze. It measures 18 feet in diameter and weighs 32 tons, and it could spin three revolutions per second. Back on board the ship, you can see the propeller cap and the nut that fastened it to the shaft. Hanging nearby is a massive wrench that required multiple men with sledgehammers to fasten the propeller onto the shaft. We now find ourselves on main deck, the outside third-class promenade area, waiting to hear the final sounding of the Queen Mary's whistles for the night. The whistles were built by Cockham Sonics, which still produces similar Typhon whistles today. These were originally steam-powered, but are operated from compressed air today to help prolong their life. They are tuned to 55 hertz, which gives her a rather deep voice. Today, the lowest ship's horn allowed by maritime laws is 75 hertz, which is a little higher in pitch. But since the Queen Mary's voice is so deep, it's no wonder why she can be heard up to 10 miles away. Get ready, because this is going to be very loud. Here's some bonus footage of the forward first-class stairwell. It still has its original linoleum, with indents from women's high heels that dug in whenever the ship rolled this way and that.
and here is the first class aft staircase. It has carpeting to dampen sound, but passengers would climb this staircase from their B-deck cabins and get to the veranda grill up on sun deck. Here is an example of one of the first class cabins. This one still has its original marquetry wood panel depicting ancient Egypt and the Nile River. You can book these beautiful wood paneled rooms, but be aware that not all the rooms look this way. The former second and third class rooms look more like this. And that's what second and third class saw too. So in a way, it is an authentic experience. You may want to double check with the hotel about what your room will look like before you book it. We are now back up on sun deck, walking aft. The red lights were part of last month's Christmas decorations. This year, 2024, will mark the 90th anniversary of Queen Mary's christening. That's when she was launched into the water for the very first time. Nine decades later, and this grand old lady still has all her charm and magic. In those nine decades, she survived an early demise due to the Great Depression. She survived the Second World War. She survived nearly being scrapped upon her retirement. She survived being scrapped in the early 1990s. And she survived a global pandemic that threatened to scrap her once again. The Queen Mary goes on, beating the odds every time. On this journey, we have seen a lot. Most of it are things that you can see without needing to buy a tour. I made this video to encourage people to visit the ship for themselves. The more people that visit, the more offerings and exhibits will open, and the refurbishments can keep going. Hopefully this video showed you some more places that you can see for yourself, and maybe it taught you a little something along the way. If you want to learn more about the Queen Mary, visit my new website. The link is in the comments below, or scan the QR code on your screen now. Thank you all for joining me. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel for more videos about the age of steam.